On this week's episode, we're going to talk about a new all AMD laptop from Tuxedo Computers. Plus, we have some riveting news about a new open source license making some waves. Welcome to episode number 349 of Destination Linux, your favorite video podcast. My name is Jill. I'm Ryan. And I'm Michael. Also, we received some interesting feedback about a previous community question related to voice-to-text tools for Linux. Now, let's get the show on the road toward Destination Linux. This week, our community feedback comes from Cal. Now, this is in response to a question we received a few weeks back about voice-to-text capabilities in Linux, and we had a few suggestions, but we asked the community for some ideas, and Cal has come through with a pretty interesting option here. He goes on to say, I love your show, and I hope I can give back a little by typing this up. In recent episode, you discussed voice-to-text solutions. I've had great success with Nerd Dictation, a simple, hackable, offline speech-to-text tool using the Vosk API. It operates locally, so it's very fast, and no data is sent to the cloud, which makes me happy. Performance on my modest hardware is really good. In general, it is a lifesaver on days when arthritis would otherwise halt my daily work. I've successfully installed Nerd Dictation on Fedora, Debian 12, and Arch. Each platform works well, though setting it up with Wayland requires a little extra effort. Pro tip, the instructions to install... The YDO tool, tool, Yodo tool, YDO tool, tool, and configuring it to start automatically when, with systemd is pretty easy and works well. To complete my setup, I wrote a script to toggle the dictation on and off and integrated it with GNOME's keyboard shortcut feature. Now I can activate it by typing or tapping a key on my keyboard. I picked the otherwise unused break key, allowing me to speak and have the text appear in any selected text field as if I were typing it. You'd think it was an integrated feature on the desktop of the desktop at this point. Importantly, Nerd Dictation is GPL licensed, so even though setting it up isn't too hard, hopefully, and this is a key part, someone could simply process and package it in a way that's less technical, uh, so less technical users could use it. Really cool recommendation, Cal, and thank you for sending that in, and thank you for telling us you love the show and giving back to the show. This is an awesome way to give back to the show because it's one that wasn't on our radar. What do you think about this one, Jill? Oh boy. So my thoughts after reading this were, you know, recently Gnome actually received a 1 million EU investment from the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is actually a German government funded initiative. And I was actually really excited to hear that Gnome plans to use the funds to improve tooling, accessibility, and support features that the users, you know, really need and want. And honestly, the GNOME desktop is currently the best at accessibility with the inclusion of the Orca screen reader and its tools, which you know are wonderfully integrated, but it could be better. And I haven't asked for GNOME. GNOME, I have a su- suggestion of an open source app that is greatly needed on Linux for those who have a hard time typing or dealing with our arthritis or carpal tunnel syndrome a good speech-to-text app that is integrated in the desktop so users like Cal can have an easier experience on the Linux desktop. And maybe GNOME could use Nerd Dictation as the back end and the amazing script that Cal wrote. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's a great idea. To me, it's kind of a perfect solution and the power of open source is you can, because this is an open source license, and it's not very well packaged. If you go to the page, it looks like very cool software but it's not packaged up for somebody who's non-technical to go set up. It has some PIP3 commands, some unpacking, some different settings, things that you got to set up and stuff like that, which would be very difficult for somebody who also has uh, any accessibility issues using the keyboard to be doing all of the setup stuff. So it makes sense we would want to package this up. Plus, we didn't even know this existed until Cal. Yeah. So oh, yeah. it's Thank also you, about people it. Yeah. Yeah. knowing it. That's a good way to contribute exists. back to the show, for sure. Absolutely. And this is something that... I agree completely, needs to be packaged and preferably in a flat pack of some kind so it could be compatible with everything. Mm -hmm. And if we could have it where it's not necessarily specific to a toolkit and to a desktop, that would be cool because I think that it would be a vital piece for all of the Linux ecosystem. And that's why I'm glad that this exists, but I think that we need to kind of have like 
some kind of accessibility efforts by multiple desktops to integrate this because this is a fundamentally important feature for people who have accessibility issues like carpal tunnel, like Jill mentioned, or arthritis. Mm -hmm. And also for people who are lazy and just don't want to type right now. Right? That's, that's what I did earlier today. <laughs> so I use my phone to do it, but it's the same kind of situation. It's so useful that once you have it, like when you don't have it, you don't know what you're missing. But once you have it, yeah. Then you you kind of will you miss it when you don't have the access to it anymore. It's the same kind of thing when I go from all the cool functionality of KDE Plasma and then I use like almost anything else, but anytime I have to use Windows if I'm helping a, a family member or something and then I just can't stand like so many things in Windows missing features and it's just because I'm used to the Plasma stuff. So it's a uh, something that I think is not only vital for accessibility, I think it's vital in general just because it's so useful for pretty much anyone. Yeah. I was even thinking, Michael, another good use of this is when you're building a new rig and you're testing it out and you don't necessarily have a keyboard handy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that happens to me quite a bit, Jill. Yeah. Yeah, good one. <laughs> I know that feeling for sure. <laughs> So you said GNOME received a million dollars in euro, and that's yeah. that's not a lot in freedom dollars. I think it's like five freedom dollars, right, Michael? When you do the it's translation, like, let's see, one point two yeah. million minus yeah. three. It's technically more powerful. Yeah, one than the yeah. US oh, dollar. Monopoly that's money is more powerful <laughs> than the freedom dollar. Not monopoly money. Oh, yeah. We're, <laughs> that so we, symbol we, look like so monopoly. they use they use euros. We use real money. It's, it's oh, different. Real money. <laughs> But uh, We're teasing, by the way, <laughs> teasing. We're completely teasing. Uh, so no, but I, you can make money go a long way with their plans, tooling, accessibility, support features. There's a lot of things there, right? You can make that go a long way by oh, utilizing yeah. some of these existing packages. So, um, you know, be like Cal. We mm -hmm. love having the community send us information like this, and this information then can get to developers at GNOME or other desktop environments so that they can integrate this stuff in. Uh, thanks to you doing that. So we want to hear from you. Send us your comments, questions, things you have, and they might appear on the show. Also, if you're offended by the joke we made about real money, go to Google, put in whatever number you want, type euro, and then say, to real money, and you'll see it's USD. <laughs> to real money. Is it really? Does That's that work? really. That's true. Wow. Oh, yeah. To real money. That's funny. I didn't know that Universal was currency. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people collect Pokemon cards. Uh, others mm -hmm. collect baseball cards. Sure. I even, I've never told people this before, have a little bit of a collection of UFC trading cards. Mm, nice. You know, I didn't even know those existed. Yeah, they're out there. And collections are vast as people's interests. You can collect things for nearly every hobby out there. However, Michael on this show has the strangest hobby of all. I have many hobbies and many collections. No, what are you talking about? This one's very weird. You collect domain names. You collect domain names like nobody I've ever seen in my life. That's like, just ridiculous. That's true. That's ridiculous. I only have about 70. What's 100, 70, 100, like my kids would say. They're <laughs> 70, like, I want 70, 100 of this because that's what it's not just 70. Like Pokemon, Michael has to collect them all. Literally, and, and I mean this, any discussion we have with Michael about a new business thing always ends with, we should buy a domain for that. That's Michael's like input of let's buy a domain for that. He wants the .com, the .net, the .biz, the .community. He wants them all. He wants to collect them all because like they're going out of style. And okay, that's a bit excessive. I, I do have a lot of domains and those conversations have happened, but .biz... Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that got you? That's the oh. one you're like, I don't collect those. I have three. <laughs> those are for plebs. I still have three. <laughs> Pleb collectors are the dot biz. So as you can imagine, this gets quite expensive uh, for us. But thankfully, I was able to find a solution for that. And that's where Namecheap comes in. Namecheap is a place where, as you guessed by their name, you can buy domains for cheap. Therefore, that Namecheap. That makes sense. Yeah, and you can also host sites and they have other services there as well. So if you want to be like Michael and collect domain names or you're actually starting a business and just need one, I suggest going to Namecheap. This is where we get ours and we have a link in the show notes where you can start your collection and support our show all at the same time. You can do both at the same time. In fact, they could probably go to a really clever URL that you probably bought, Michael. So I got a domain for this, yes. Ryan. What you do? <laughs> What's that domain, Michael? Destinationlinux.net slash Namecheap. 
See, the dot net was a thing, but I wish it was dot biz now because then I've been like, oh, you did buy a dot biz. <laughs> well, so dot net. I could add to my collection, Ryan. What about yeah. dot TV? Well, yeah. <laughs> no, don't don't encourage him, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> so click that link and see if you can out collect Michael. So there's this new new story that's kind of taken off Michael about mm-hmm. open source license, a yes. new one. Yes, brand new. Yeah. This is because my thing. Yes, licenses. Cool. Let's go. <laughs> it's yes. like a spreadsheets for Michael, man. He gets so pumped over this stuff. <laughs> and really, I wanted to get your feedback on this because out of everyone, you've done a lot of work actually studying this. I think probably because you had to battle people in comments and YouTube for so many years. That <laughs> battle people in comments. That's yeah. not really what it's from. But yeah, I, I, there is a lot of debate I've involved involved in. And Licensing is interesting because of the fact of like the difference between free software, free culture licensing and open source licensing. There is a difference. And a lot of people don't know that. It's a very confusing world. Like we say open source license and everyone kind of accepts it. And then you start looking at all of the options out there and you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. What's the difference between this license that's co- yeah. that has a ton of legalese versus this other one has a even more legalese, you know, yeah. or the difference between the, the GPL and the AGPL and the LGPL. Well, and the GPL too. The, well, <laughs> you, you can avoid the version yeah. numbers. But it's a whole nother one. If you do, but also, there are some things that don't avoid the version numbers, like the <laughs> Linux kernel. You, you can ski, you could go to the GPL3 and yeah. be fine because that's the latest version, but the Linux kernel uses the GPL2 uh-huh. plus <laughs> some extra stuff on top, like some little sprinkles uh, yeah. and maybe like a couple cherries. But it's it's interesting because there's so like much it. nuance to it. And at the same time, people love licensing and legal conversations. Yeah, they love it. And, you know, love it. what makes a complex situation less complex? Add more. Add more what? licensing options. We get to talk about another license? I'm so excited. One. What's this one called, Ryan? It's called the Functional Source License, or FSL. Yes. And... Mm. So what's interesting about this is there's a lot of articles out there that are calling this open washing, open source washing. Some are just talking about it in general, but some are acting like this is not a good thing. This is this is going to hurt open source in some way. So what better place to bring it than this show? And we'll have us tell you our opinion in the community. We'd love to hear your opinion on this as well. And so the really first question is, is this really open source or is this a trap? Like in the Star Wars thing. Yeah, it's a trap. It's a trap. You know? It's a good question. And based on my research, it is... A trap. Technically, neither. Oh. It's not open source by default, and it isn't a trap either, because eventually it does become open source. So I would go with... uh, Maybe, kind of... All right, let me explain it to people so they can kind of be on that yeah, train. Give more you. details as to what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Let's talk about how FSL describes itself. So, this is their words The functional source license is mostly permissive, non compete license, mostly being a keyword there, that converts to Apache 2.0 or MIT after two years. It is designed for software as a service companies that value both user freedom and developer sustainability. FSL provides everything a developer needs to use and learn from your software without harmful free writing. Free writing mm. being a term that they utilize throughout the site to refer to this product and what it, this license and what it's able to do. And, you know, the mention specific sense. things too, like tragedy of commons. And according to this concept that they specifically use, Tragedy of Commons is a number of people enjoy unfettered access to a finite, valuable resource such as a pasture. They will tend to overuse it. It may end up destroying its value altogether. So that's what the Tragedy of Commons is. And that's mentioned on their site talking about FSL. So free writing. This that's is interesting. Mm-hmm. That. The first thing I thought was immediately followed by another thing. So the first thing was that software is not finite. So it's not an exact comparison and like a good analogy for that but then i thought well the time that it takes for the developer to create something is finite that's so point. justifying their time involved i can see why this would be a problem but i also feel like this is a solution to a problem that is very specific to certain types of industry 
you said that it's for the software as a service. And for those who don't right. know, that also is an acronym of SAS. So it's really just related to sassy companies. <laughs> oh, all that for a dad joke. All man. that for a dad joke. Wow. But I also wow. still believe that's true. Uh, but I also wanted to kind of go into a little more detail about the the fact that it becomes open source later does make it kind of an open source license. It's more of a delayed open, open source. Open washing. License. How dare you? So it's not open washing because it's uh, not saying for for sure that it's not op- that it is open source and then it isn't. It is technically open source, but on a time delay. So yes, yeah. it is open after two years. So like that's kind of the where the the nuance of this particular license. And it's also interesting because this topic is it comes up all the time. I've covered something similar to this on Twill many times, but not specifically this license, but things like the project Redis. Redis we used to be an open source product. And then they turned it into a open core product or the comp- the product from uh, Terraform. I forgot who made Terraform, but HashiCorp. HashiCorp made Terraform. And then they decided to turn it into an open core system and it's no longer fully open source. So then you have the Linux Foundation making to- uh, Tofu or Open Tofu, something like that, where they make a fork of it and, make, and, and it creates a whole mess. And the reason... Actually, it's mostly the same. But the reason is that some of these projects are creating a software that is so well ad- established and so popular that big tech companies go in and say, oh, is it open source so we can take it? Yes, it is. Great. We take it. And then they do. And then they basically siphon all the popularity from away from the people who made it because they have so much like clout in the space. And for one example, like Redis, their their main reason for the issue was Amazon because Amazon made a competing product based on their own code and it created an issue for them and they can't really compete with with Amazon in terms of resources and stuff, right? You're because right. it's Amazon. So I get why this would be a problem for some companies and I get why the FSL exists because in a way... It sort of is solving a problem that does exist. I've seen people argue about this being like, oh, you're solving a problem that doesn't exist. It it does. Yeah. Well, BSL is what they're replacing here. And BSL is basically, for all intents and purposes, seemed like the same thing as FSL, except it required four years before the software became open. This is a two-year timetable, which is a lot less, but still provides some cover from the company and still provide some push for them to innovate at the same time. Because four years is a long time in the software world. That's a really long time. Uh, Two years is a long time too, don't get me wrong, but it gives some push still to have that two-year timetable that, hey, we're going to have to innovate way past where we are now in two years because otherwise somebody could go out there and just become competition or a competition could take this and hurt us through it. So. It makes sense to me why they want to do this. And from a user standpoint, really nothing changes. If you're just a regular user who wants to run this independently on oh, yeah. your system, you can do that even before the two years is up. Right. It's really just competition, commercial use yeah, of specific yeah. use case. It's actually a reasonable license because of that. Now, the to me, the license is... Not uh, there's a quote that they have on their blog post announcing this change for this license, and it says, We value user freedom and developer sustainability. Free and open source software values user freedom exclusively. That is the source of its success and the source of its free rider problem that occasionally boils over into a full blown tragedy of commons, such as Heartblade and Log for Shell. I'm not really sure that those would be good examples. I, mean, I would say the other ones would be better examples, but. They are saying the strength of open source is also its greatest weakness. And that is a a complaint that's existed for a very long time. There are so many amazing projects that are open source that you can point to and say, open source is better. Then there's other ones that are not better. And it just depends on how many people are there to make that product good and how many people are there who are dedicated to having it a successful thing. And did it get kind of copied by another product? Because there have been companies in the past that their product was open source and they were copied and then put out of business because they couldn't sustain the competition between a company who was 
basically taking their exact same thing and doing nothing different. That so is a potential yeah. problem, right? So I think it's interesting that they point out that the existing licensors or the concept of a copyleft values exclusively user freedom because I, I would say that that's true. It focuses on the user and what is what is fair to them, but it doesn't consider the developer side or the company side. And I think that's a fair perspective. And I think it's a good point because I've always had one issue with the GPL. And that is, it does not protect the people who make the code. It makes sure that the code that you release cannot be turned proprietary, which does protect in some way, but it doesn't protect from someone who literally takes your code and puts it on a server. In right. fact, there's, they, had to they had to make another s s version of the GPL to even address that part in the first place. So if you're not technically giving away the binary, you could, for a while, get away with not even giving the source code. So that's why the AGPL was created in the first place. So this is the kind of issue that needs to be addressed in certain ways, and the GPL is just not in the process of doing that, or it doesn't even seem like it wants to do that. And that's fine. Not every license needs to cover everything because some licenses are good for some companies and some good some for others. But I think this is a good idea because it's kind of like getting your foot in the door or gradually, you know, you know, sticking your foot in the pool so you can get used to the water before you jump all the way in. And this is a good way for companies to kind of do open source, but not fully open source just yet. So what do you think you know? about companies like Red Hat? Red Hat has been making some moves that to us appear like they're trying to, you know, keep companies from the free riding a little bit, some of their competitors. Would this be an option for them if Red Hat switched to this? Would you be like, okay, well, Red cool. Hat? Red Hat can't switch to it because of the tools they use are GPL, and every and if, if the libraries are GPL that you're using, the stuff on top can't be something else unless there is some kind of agreement or an abstraction layer, and even then, it's very complicated and messy. So I don't think that they, they would do that, but I do think that it's understandable if a company wants to do it, and I do think it's understandable what Red Hat is doing in terms of. They want to make sure that people are not taking an exact copy of their product and then right. pretending that they're doing anything special at all, even when their marketing says bug for bug or one-to-one -one compatible, when your, your entire purpose of your company is to market yourself as a copy, I just think right. that's unethical in the I first think this place. Could bring, so I, I you like attach that. That you could bring new companies in open source with this. Because, I, you know, in a way... Mm -hmm. You could still, your competition can still learn about what you're doing. You can't use the code, but you can learn right. from it. You can run it internally. You could modify it. You know, you have all of the code still there. You could technically it's take it. And as long as the code is not the same, and as long as you are not like some, there are some arguments and some legal issues where if you've ever seen the code in the first place, you're not yeah. legally required or legally allowed to write but code it's putting based some on it. risk. My, my point yeah. is company, the companies doing this still have some risk from that. Cause you could, sure. they may have been able to write their own code for this whole section, but couldn't figure out how the company did this. And they could read the code and be like, Oh yeah, that's a solution and do it just a little bit different. And like you said, there could be some legalese right, right. there, but Companies have done far worse things, right? So I, I think That's that true. there's still risk there that they're putting in, but I think more companies, this is a lot less risk that a company would be doing in this case than, you know, the alternative, number one, being proprietary and just leaving it proprietary, which we don't like. We like companies, more companies to do more open source. This is something that I think might encourage some companies to come over. I don't know. So Jill, we've given our points. I'm not against it. I uh, don't think it's the greatest license ever made. I don't think it's a bad license. I totally understand mm -hmm. it. Where do you fall on this? I think it's good for open source, honestly, because there are so many different licenses for software because of the unique needs of both commercial and smaller community projects. And naturally, they will evolve and grow over time and new licenses will need to be created. We're probably going to have a, a few more in a few years. <laughs> It's just, it's going to happen. And this is one of the ways in which, you know, open source actually progresses and needs to expand. And in this, this new world of, it's not so new now, but the world of AI and cloud infrastructure, that's mm -hmm. going to be pushed even more. And we're going to need uh, more licenses and more resources so more that people licenses. are prote protected. 
Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. <laughs> the the functional source license is is actually trying to strike a balance in that gray area between complete freedom of copyleft and a lockdown with restrictions. And honestly, I do think there is a good option. This is a good option, especially for software as a service and companies with lot, large cloud infrastructures and AI and to yeah. give them more protection. And it is absolutely much better to have two years of limited use than the four-year right. limited use of the business source license. So this is a huge improvement for commercial and business with open source. I agree. Yeah, I think that's well said, Jill. And I'm interested in what our community thinks. I know some people are like, hey, if it's not completely open, do whatever you want with it, BSD style license, then I don't want it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair. You can have that stance on all the software yeah. you develop. But for everyone who has people that they're paying to build these things, they have competition riding their heels, this seems like still uh, a great option. I wouldn't call it open washing. I think it's just a company, you know, utilizing, putting their foot in the water, as Michael said. They're, they're yeah. putting their toes in the water open source and seeing how warm the water is. And it's very warm because Michael peed in it. <laughs> okay oh well i'm glad we got that out of the way yes. uh so i do just to put like so we can end this t segment on less weird terms the i do think it's important to note that it's kind of similar to a patent you know you have the protection of the patent and then eventually everybody can use oh, whatever the I thing the is patent system though i, I know no, where you're going but the I patent like the, system no, no, no. there's so a corrupt. difference between the patent system and First of all, software patents are stupid because you you they're they're patenting the dumbest thing ever for the, like the most frivolous things, and they're getting away with it, and that's insane. But and also the patents take are like 15, 25 years or something. This is the same kind of concept, but without the insanity attached, because it's only two years, and it's only and it's a license that the person who is making the software is agreeing to put on it. And the user person who is using the software is agreeing to be okay with using it that way. So it's not necessarily even, it's not, it's, it's the similar concept of a, of a patent, but done, I think, better. But I still want to say that the, I gave an example earlier of co tech companies taking software and, you know, doing their own thing with it. BSD license is notorious for this kind of thing because the biggest example has ever been made is Apple taking FreeBSD and other components and turning it into macOS. The, and people love macOS. A lot of people do. And FreeBSD and all the BSD things are not benefiting from all of that improvement because the license allows Apple to turn it proprietary, which of course they did. So this approach is saying, hey, we just want to protect ourselves Dang for a small example. amount of time. Yeah. And then we're going to let you have it completely open right so i get why people aren't okay with that into a some degree but i also argue that this is a much more commercially friendly method of making software even making open source software because if you're suggesting that a, a company needs to just open everything and just say hey take all of our code and do whatever you want with it then most of the time i think people are going to choose to not do that out of fear because well, it goes with the finite resource there. You're yeah. right. Software is not finite, but the developer's time and the money they're using to pay those developers is. And so, yeah, I think it's a good balance. Uh, I think we've covered this really well and I'm interested to see what the community thinks. So let us know what your thoughts are on the new FSL license and if it bothers you or it's something you think is great for open source overall. And also whatever license you prefer, don't pee in the pool. <laughs> or do. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and LinStore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community and they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features. Linbit provides enterprise grade software that runs on a variety of platforms and OSs without vendor lock-in. What that means is, is that you could use the software on any platform, including specific hardware, 
that you want to use or just off the shelf hardware that you get and connect it. You get, all of this stuff can be interchanged really easily. And with DRBD and Lens Store, you can have high speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long distance replication. Linbit is run by its founders to this day, and all of its engineers and developers are in house with offices in Europe and North America which allows them to have global 24-7 support to complement their enterprise offerings. Visit linbit.com to learn more about the people behind Linbit and the awesome software for block storage, duplication, and more. So on to some more pleasant news, or not as confusing news as licensing and things. Like is more pleasant news because the new license is pleasant. I like it's, it. It is pleasant. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to talk about some hardware, Michael, and everyone loves hardware. Mm, you can't not hardware. Is fun. Hardware is fun. <laughs> yeah. And Tuxedo has some really cool, exciting hardware. The specs are kind of insane here. And we're big fans of AMD. I'm a huge fan of AMD and have been mm. for a while. And this is an all AMD laptop. So mm. it's immediately a slam dunk, right? Right? Well, the way you said that, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you, maybe it's not. So <laughs> No, I think it is. I think it's really cool. So Tuxedo Computers launched an all AMD gaming laptop. There's no AMD plus NVIDIA combo because I know people are going to say, hey, there's all AMD laptops out there. That's true. But usually if they're going to have a, a secondary GPU, it's going to be NVIDIA or something else. They're not putting in um, an AMD all the way through and through. And this one is AMD all the way through and through, which makes it special, I think. Mm -hmm. makes and makes special. it not Christmas related because the red and green. Continue. True. true. <laughs> this is true. This Michael. is a 16.1 inch IPS LED backlit 165 hertz 2560 by 1440. No 1920 by 1080. Nice. So they automatically. Yay. Woohoo. They're not, they're not getting hit. They're not getting that asterisk next to them. That's good. Yeah. And I like the 16 inch form factor. I think that's a very, especially for a desktop replacement, that's a great screen size. Also, 100% sRGB for the screen, which is mm -hmm. very nice. Michael, why does that something like that matter? It matters for color accuracy. And if someone wants to be a uh, graphic designer or doing video production or a, uh, any kind of colorist, you need to have as accurate as you can and 100% is what is basically the perfect you can do it. Now there there you might even see 120% mm -hmm. and that actually mm -hmm. means worse than 100%, so don't do those. Uh, but you might see 93, 95, 99 or 100 and those are all okay, but 99 or 100 is the best because it's going to be the most accurate for that particular color space. Now of course there are other color spaces, but you would have to look at the specs for that. So if I'm working on a picture and uh, let's say I'm making a picture of somebody in a purple dress and I send it over to Michael and Michael says, Ryan, it was supposed to be a purple dress. Why is it red? That might be because I have a cheap screen that's not 100% uh, SRGB. It won't be that bad, but there are going to be distinctive differences. It's, it's more like, for example, you tried to make a red thing and then you sent me a magenta. Like that yeah. that's the kind yeah. of thing because you can't tell the difference like... Purple and red are significantly different, but if, if there's going to be di various different shades where you can't really tell the difference between, you know, a certain type of yellow or an orange or the, a, a certain type of green and even a yellow. So there's many configurations that that could turn badly. And if you ever want to do professional work, you need the color to be as good as you can. So this is fantastic. Like if someone from opinion. our community wanted to make the art of Michael peeing in the pool, and you've got the blue water. Why and is the it yellow. me? You're the one who is defending <laughs> yellow. it. I think it's it has spreading to be you throughout now. the pool. It has to you be know, Ryan doing sure sure that art. It's a Poor pure Ryan. Yellow we, there. we might have just discovered Michael that he's colorblind. <laughs> oh well, that might explain a lot of the artwork I send Michael. That right, does so. explain a lot. Yeah, I, uh, would, I was so the recently he showed me this thumbnail. Hey, we're like, moving wait, on, Michael. We're moving you, on. Like. Oh, we are moving we're, on? Okay. We're moving on. It's got two times M2 2280 SSD slots using PCI Express 4.0, hybrid and discrete graphics, AMD Radeon 780M, yeah. and of course, you have your RX 7600 MXT with 8 gigabytes of GDDR6. So that's really, really nice there, and that's one of the big differences, making it pure AMD all the way through and through. Ryzen 7 7840. Eight cores, sixteen threads, five point one gigahertz max. That's 
That's crazy talk. Crazy, That's crazy mm-hmm. talk. You got DDR5 up to 86 gigabytes, aluminum chassis, four speakers on this, like uh, 80 yeah. watt hour battery for up to six hours of play. Real quick and question though, are the speakers pointing up? That's actually a really good question. I don't know if they're pointing up. Hopefully they are pointing up and not firing into your lap like a lot of laptops like to do, which is silliness. And then five-year guarantee from Tuxedo. It's made in Germany. Starts at about $1,699 euro, around $1,858 US. So those last three specs are the ones that gave me some pause. Now, I want to say Tuxedo's What's wrong awesome. with being made in Germany, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my family ancestry means I'm made in Germany. So nothing is wrong with being made in Germany. But that was part uh, of the last three sentences. You're right. Okay. Skip that one and the other two. Okay. Now gotcha. it makes no sense. Darn it. All right. So the things that gave me pause is, and this is not unusual. This is not a tuxedo problem. Let me be very clear. This is not a tuxedo thing. If you're in the market for this, This is an awesome laptop. I love everything about it. It is basically a spec behemoth. They put everything in the kitchen sink into this laptop. But when I think about the competition out there and the price of this, I start to get like, uh, because there's nothing really but specs on this. This is just, let's throw a ton of everything into this machine. It's thick. It looks like it's kind of heavy. I didn't look at the weight for it specifically, but you know the thickness of it tells me it's going to be Is pretty heavy. It's a nice workstation. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's a desktop replacement. And then when I think about other desktop replacements options out there, couldn't help but think about Frameworks right here. And mm-hmm. Frameworks has something that, in my opinion, differentiates it entirely from the competition, right? The complete modularity and repairability of it. Now, this is a, I think Tuxedo uses a lot of Clevo chassis, so probably has repairability, but the modularity isn't going to be there. At least that's not what they're touting. And I think if you're going to compete in the world of Mac, where you've got this 80 watt hour battery that's six hours of play, which let's be honest, every time we see this in any computer laptop, that six hours is probably, depending on what you're doing, more like three to four. Yeah, and Like the best you know that, possible, you know, yeah. Testing. Yeah, they're like, they're dimming it all the way down and they're just opening a text file and they're like, look, last six hours. But usually if you're actually watching video and stuff, it becomes less than that. But even if they got the six hours, if you look at like a Mac laptop, you're at 18 to 24 hours and it's going to have enough power to do all of the rendering this machine can do, probably more. And it's going to be doing everything but maybe gaming on it. And so... This well, becomes an not issue, gaming, but other parts, yeah. Where I feel like you have to differentiate yourself from the competition in a big way because you're asking for a big spend here. It's, it's also crazy because if you think about it, the fact that laptops have been lacking innovation for decades, uh, yes. decades, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's always this iterative spec improvements and stuff like that. And this is a very interesting laptop and it has a lot of cool specs Gorgeous. and I would love to have this type of laptop. Me too. But I agree that for that price, you could kind of get something more, even if it's not better spec, it might be more interesting to have. And that could be the framework, for example. I personally would love to see Tuxedo or System76 or anybody else do some kind of partnership with Framework and create a more specced out version or something like that where they could have the same kind of modularity of the Framework camps, but, you know, something like, a, you know, extra special stuff on top. That would be fantastic because I think the Framework is not the greatest thing ever in terms of specs because it does miss some features here and there. But I do think that as far as innovation and interesting, it's really hard to beat that one. Yeah, I, I think like if I, money was no issue, I would have a tuxedo laptop and a framework laptop. Like I'd have oh, yeah, at least three. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and a system 76. Like throw that in there too. I'd buy them all. But money is an issue. And so if I was going to pick one, that's where I think, and the only reason I'm suggesting this, because I'm very happy for them. This is an awesome machine. They put all the great specs in here. It's just actually as a suggestion to the company to be like, you know, I think it's time to really look at innovating differently in the repairability, the modularity area, or something else that just Mm -hmm. completely differentiates you from 
the competition, especially at this price point, because otherwise I think most people are probably going to either not have that money to spend or be looking for a different solution at that. This is a five pound machine, by the way, I looked up the weight, 2.3 mm-hmm. kilograms, about Pretty five heavy. pounds. It's, a, it's mm-hmm. very heavy and it's meant to be a desktop replacement. So that's yeah. fine. These have been around for a long time. Um, but they threw all the specs in there and I at least plod them for that. Like the specs are fantastic. Mm. I mean, they, everything you could want in a laptop from a power standpoint is great there. screen, great yeah. mm-hmm. so, amount yeah. of power with the GPU awesome and, uh, it like, it looks good. And there's that too. And yeah. the, pr- the price is not insane, but it's pretty not high for what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's, uh, it's high enough where it's in a certain type of tier. It's a, it's in a tier of computers that you're being compared to with a lot of pro, com, a lot of very high end competition. You are being compared to with Apple. You're being compared to with the framework, of course, but you're also being compared with at the highest level Dells, the highest level HPs, and yeah, all these different things. Pads, so if you're going to be against those, you need to do something to set yourself apart. And while the specs of this thing are much better than most of those laptops, it isn't just specs that gets people to purchase things. And I feel like you can't... It's an I Intel underst- inside sticker. That's the answer. <laughs> it's that. <laughs> it's, it's because you made AMD. That's the problem. But ser- no, seriously, that's not. AMD's awesome. Uh, but I do think that there is a, a factor of if you were to lower the price point, I get why that would be a problem because you would lower the margins. Probably they're not high margins in the first place. Right. Uh, but if you're going to compete at that space, you have to do something to stand out. And because there are so many computer companies... Uh, it, it's hard to stand out these days. It is. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's why I think Frameworks has made a name for itself because it did something truly different in that arena. And no, uh, I do want to say that I love the fact that Tuxedo is so customizable. Like you can make it your own. You can, they stand out in that way, but it's not necessarily that, like the, the fact that you can etch the machine to whatever design you want on the, on the back, like instead of having like the Apple logo, you could have your logo or something like that, or you can have my face? keycaps and stuff. <laughs> yeah, you could even have Ryan's face if for some reason you wanted that. <laughs> you could do all these sorts of things and Tuxedo stands out in that way and those are very yeah. cool, but those are kind of like nice to haves versus, oh, this is a fundamental reason why we should use this instead of that. Yeah. Yeah, this is true. What do you think, true. Jill? Well, um, First I... First of all, Jill... I don't think you have enough computers. Yeah. So you need to add this to your wish list. Yeah, get two of them. I do, absolutely. In fact, uh, this would be a good option for me instead of my my old, I have a 10-year-old Asus Republic of Gamers laptop that still kicks butt even today with, you know, gaming and everything. It's, you know, older 1080 uh, P screen, but Mm -hmm. it's still a great computer. And I use it when I'm doing like, remote podcasting because it has the big 17.3 inch screen. So for me, I like the bigger laptops and I like that, you know, they went with this beautiful 16.1 WQHD display with running 165 Hertz. And that's great for a laptop. And the fact that it's 100% sRGB for a gaming laptop is really good. <laughs> mm-hmm. In the 165 hertz. Yeah, yeah and 165. Because most of the gaming uh, laptops um, that I have in my collection are like 90% or 95% sRGB. They're not the full 100. So yeah. that, that's really great. And I was actually really impressed with Tuxedo's uh, website. Um, they did a nice presentation of the laptop on the website and it was really fun because I clicked on the link and the first thing you see is a nice picture of the laptop with an animated Starfield warping on the screen that transitions yeah. to an AMD they CPU. Call it the binary and, star. Yes. It, yeah. It's the Sirius is the dog star. <laughs> Very cute. What? Very cute. You guys are, you don't know that reference? <laughs> no, I, I just thought, I thought it was some, what is that? Uh, when people look into the stars and have a whole yeah, thing. Yeah, it's figured, called the Sirius is the dog star because the, the constellation is named after a dog. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, now I know that information. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry Learn about to that. read the stars, Michael. Gee. Yeah. Hey, so that, you, the- you need to be quiet, you big dipper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the, the, that, that was really cool on the website, how the screen, you know, it goes from a star field warping to a transition to an AMD CPU and GPU logos Jill's on so glowing stars. <laughs> you know, I thought it was we're really over well here, done. like saying what do you all mean, this big stuff and, and Jill's yeah. just over here, just 
doting on it, you know, just yeah. doting. Well, I mean, we, we are being critical, <laughs> but we're being hopeful critical. Like we want helpful Tuxedo critical. to be the, because they, they have the potential <laughs> and they have so many ways to be like the number one go-to product. Yeah. And we just want that to happen. And this is a very close option for that. I think we're, I also think that the, in, maybe it's because after you're in, after you're in this, in the tech world for so long, you kind of get jaded with the idea that laptops don't change and mm -hmm. yeah. you want You want more, you know, newness, not necessarily new, but just something different, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But also, yes, Jill is way more positive than us. Okay, good. Just make sure we establish that. You're not wrong about that. <laughs> All right, Jill, continue. Speaking continue of doting. space. <laughs> yes, speaking of space, do you dream of getting off this planet and going to space? Yes. And, and being okay, able hold, on to a hold on a second, Jill. Ryan, how many times have you picked a space <laughs> game on this show? Mm -hmm. And more importantly, how many times have you used that exact sentence about getting off this planet in order well, to put no, that Jill on? No, Jill said it. Yeah. Jill said well, yes, but you wrote it. <laughs> Oh, well, look, uh, I don't know if you've noticed this and, mm -hmm. you know, let, let us know in the comments, but this planet continues to get dumber and dumber by the minute. Like mm -hmm. it's, if, if you've seen the movie Idiocracy, it is now a documentary of this planet. And so when I see a space game and I start playing one, the first thing I think of is that'd be nice to get off this planet and leave these dumb people behind. You know, I take a few of you like Jill. Mm -hmm. I would take for sure. <laughs> uh, I would take my kids. Michael, you would yeah. stay here with your people. I was wa I was waiting for it. <laughs> I was waiting for it. You would actually, stay I was your I was actually expecting you to say, "I'm waiting. Uh, I'm you're going to stay here and just stay in the pool because you already ruined it." <laughs> already ruined oh pool. no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently that's going to be stuck in the show. That, so, that's why you know <laughs> when I think about space, I think about escaping the stupidity. Of the world. Yeah, I, I, okay. It's fair. That is uh, an issue that I will. Uh, I don't think the idiocracy thing is necessarily a documentary, but it is darn near close. It is scarily accurate to what we're you living seen the in. Quantity now. of people wearing Crocs nowadays, like that's hilarious. It's For those who literally. don't know, the guy who created Idiocracy the movie chose like the Crocs were no one used wore them whatsoever. And he chose to he chose those shoes because he said in an interview, I wanted to pick the dumbest shoe I could find that was the ugliest and most worthless thing ever. And then now everyone has one. <laughs> yeah. and it's just it's kind of hilarious. But yep. at the same time, I I, I rewatched that movie fairly recently, a few months ago. I didn't finish it because I already knew what was happening, but it's it's not that bad. We're you know still at least because you're living it. You're living that movie right now. And <laughs> listen, I know there's people out there who are highly offended right now about the fact that they're wearing Crocs listening to this show. And I just want to tell you that repent, 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 <laughs> change your ways. Not even we're not even trying to apologize. We're telling you repent. repent. <laughs> Throw Go them out. And also, shoes. you know, it's funny. This is side side point. I wanted to get some shoes that were good for like, you know, going to the beach or whatever. Cause I, I, I usually only have sneakers and stuff. So I wanted to get something and I, I found something that fit my feet, which for those who don't know, I have very large feet and, uh, they were not Crocs worse. They're knockoff Crocs. <laughs> oh God. Oh yeah. Box. Yeah. And they're not, on they're my not feet. the real rubber. They're like the, the foamy. Rubber oh, they're cross. not even foamy. They're they're plasticky. Yeah, so yeah. I used them maybe three times and then got these uh, sandals. I mean, there things. are <laughs> certain occasions where a croc could be socially acceptable. Uh, as long as you don't wear where socks in the crocs, other people aren't around, then it's socially acceptable. You know, so other people, it's not accessible acceptable unless <laughs> they also have crocs. Yeah. Well, unless you go to like a should, crocs, uh, uh, you know, crocs users anonymous or something. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Oh, sorry, Jill. You were okay. going to tell us about a game in space. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh, wait, that's what this topic was about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the game this week is called Astro Miner, and it is indeed a space game. In this game, you embark on an epic space adventure in Astro Miner, where you must build a base, overcome challenges, and construct mm. a spaceship to return home from the asteroid belt. 
that that's comes- a problem for this game, Ryan. <laughs> the return goal is home. to return home. That does not fit your moment. You're like mo for this kind of. Yeah. Thing. Well, it does because if you think about it, you got what happens is you're out in space and you like you forget why you left in the first place. So you know, give him two weeks. He'll rocket boost right the heck back into space as soon as he comes back to Earth and yeah. sees everything. Yeah. Still <laughs> the, the, rel- the time relativity will, you know, time dilation will give you like a different yeah. perspective when you get back. Like, like maybe it changed. Maybe they're not wearing Crocs anymore. It comes back. Nope, still Crocs and boosts right the heck back out. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, this fun game, Astro Miner, features crafting, base building, ship building, and has mini games to deploy antennas, establish communications with Earth, Ryan, with Earth, and mm. align your, your rocket and fly home. <laughs> well, in fairness, I would establish communication to Earth too and just be like, repent, change your ways. I just keep saying that over again. <laughs> Very or it'd be good. Like, it'd be like just a message, like an SOS message that says, good luck. Good luck. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Off the stupid rock. Oh. All right, Jill, tell me about the software spotlight. Okay. So the software spotlight this week is called Carburet Tor. That's T O R is in the Tor network. Nice. <laughs> like carburetor. I hope it's actually said that. <laughs> yeah, that, like, I don't. Carburetor. We don't know <laughs> for developer, sure, but. The I developers hope so. might need to correct me. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, and developers, if that's wrong, <laughs> repent. Yeah. Repent and change or if it's way. good and you like to use it. <laughs> so it's an easy carburetor is a is an easy to use GUI to for connecting through the Tor network. Nice. You know, uh, check it out. This is you know a graphical settings app for the the app tractor, which is a package. Tractor. That- <laughs> oh yeah. Tra- Tor, you're right. Yeah, Tor. Man, it, is, it is the KDE with the K thing. Yes. Yeah. So this is a graphical settings app for Tractor, which is a package that uses the Python stem library to provide a connection through the cool onion proxy. It sets up the proxy in user session so you don't have to mess up with Tor on your system anymore. Oh, that rhymes. So... <laughs> This was originally designed for mobile to easily connect up to the Onion network, but it's now available on your lovely Linux desktop as well. There's no messy config files, just an easy to use and navigate GUI. Carburetor is natively packaged for Debian, Ubuntu, and the AUR, but is also available as a convenient flat pack. Nice. I like it. I like it. Nice, nice, nice. All right, so next up, we're going to be talking about the tip of the week. And one of the ways phishing attacks happen is actually clicking a link that looks real, but it's mm-hmm. actually fake. Oh. <gasps> Repent. It's a fake link. <laughs> Repent for clicking the link. True. Well, it's actually an interesting situation because sometimes the links look legitimate and they True. put a lot of effort into looking legitimate. And you mm-hmm. have to look at the URL to make sure that it is the correct thing. But we also have another way of figuring it out. So we've, while we've announced on this show many times, you never click links in an email. Yeah. You may happen occasionally to do so. And if you do have that lapse of judgment, your password manager may be giving you another clue to remind you of your mistake. For example, password managers like Bitwarden won't show you that you have saved passwords or a username for URLs it doesn't recognize. So when you put in a password, you typically put in the username, password, and the URL so it can reference them. So if you click a link in the email and it doesn't have the display of your passwords, well, then it probably doesn't have the right place. It's a clue. We're like the Hardy Boys. You got a clue. We're so we're, we're like detectives that yeah. are children. So the the, the this is also another it reminds me of this uh, story I heard on another podcast. I'm not sure which podcast. I wish I could remember. But they were talking about how this person is in the security like industry, and he almost got fished. So it happens even to the best of us. It totally can happen right. to even tech people, mm-hmm. especially in the if all of the worst possible scenarios could uh, you know nicely or uh, not nicely align to create the perfect storm. For example, his his situation was that he was expecting a package from UPS and he received an email from a phishing attack that was tailored as if it was UPS 
talking about missing a package and needing to get correct address information. So he was about to do it because he was getting trying to get a UPS package and it did not come through. It was missed. So all of these pieces kind of aligned. And then right at the last minute, he just, I'm going to look to make sure this is an, a legit. And he noticed that it wasn't. So mm -hmm. even the most tech savvy people can be tricked mm -hmm. if they have enough information. And what are the odds that these people didn't know some details about this person and still I mean, be able to time that? Like, I don't know. Being it's sold. crazy. You know, you never know. All of our information is being sold. They know what you buy. They could, you know, do a pretty easy calculation to know when you're supposed to receive it or when you're expecting it. This stuff's getting more sophisticated. I think that's the point here. And you need to use measures to be thinking about. I was thinking even in search engines, like we have an obscene amount of trust in search engines. Because mm -hmm. if you have a link yeah. in your email, you're like, don't click it. I know that. Ryan, Michael, and Jill have told me that for years. But then you go to the search engine and you look up your bank and you click the option there, you're just assuming that that first option is the legitimate one because most and of the time it probably is. Yeah. is. But because of the what if it's not one time? Section. What if you utilize the sponsored things really throwing people in ads as well that they throw in the sponsored section, which is technically kind of like an ad thing. And it could be a bank like Bank of America and you're clicking it and it's just a sponsored ad that you looked for Bank of America on like you've got to be cautious all the way around now like this stuff is getting very sophisticated or for example if you're trying to find the bank chase but you accidentally find the bank follow um chase yeah. follow. oh that's, that's a, a good thing. one that's a good one Michael but even people who create their own search engines they might even be more susceptible like search based stuff to having fake insertions of records that are pushed to the top that are actually fake sites like mm -hmm. i was thinking about that i haven't researched it let me know if somebody's seen something like that because it feels like that could be a thing right mm -hmm. yeah it could totally be a thing i don't know if it's okay. a thing but it's possible well you know you could talk to us in person about it too if yeah. you want to come to scale 2024 or which is scheduled for march 14th through the 17th at the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena, California. Now oh, that's, that's 2024, perfect. not 2023. We're already past March in 2023. Oh, th thank you for explaining yeah. how time works. Appreciate that. <laughs> yep. So 2024 is when you want to come, March 2024, and you'll be able to hang out with the entire DL crew there, and you'll be able to see Jill because she'll have a crowd around her probably, and she'll be wearing the penguin hat. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're looking for us, we'll, we'll be there. If you don't know what the penguin hat looks like, watch the video version of Every episode we have ever talked about scale, <laughs> yes. you will see the pink man. <laughs> yes. Jill has it. She makes sure she has it every episode. And this is my new Destination Linux shirt, too. So I'm planning. But to Jill, you had a nice. really cool mug. I mean, like probably the greatest mug I've ever seen. Yes, I do. Speaking yeah, look of at which, that. I got man. the DOS Geek mug. Yeah. No, I'd be proud to drink out of that mug. That's, yeah. that's that is mug. not the best mug I've ever seen. That mug, it's a on good the mug, mug, is beautiful. It's a really good mug. I will say that. And also, yeah. I did technically make that design for the mug, but yes, you did. Still, the okay, fine, you win. It's the best. Okay, cool. So, a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or Just listening. Because I made it. In Linux, even if you wear Crocs, thank you for watching the show. <laughs> Hopefully, this episode oh helps my. you change. Your sinful ways. Even if you wear Crocs. Crocs. And you have to have lots of flair, lots of giblets. Also, yeah. if you see us on, you, you meet us on scale, you can sh you can explain to us why Crocs are so valuable if you do insist on them. <laughs> You're going to lose a lot of points with me if you start talking to me about Crocs at scale. I'm just yeah. saying. I won't be trying to exit that conversation real quick. I'll be like, oh, really? That's interesting. You just see me fade away in the background. All right. Join us on our Discord at textdigital.com slash Discord if you want to watch the live show, the show live or the live show. You can become a patron and do both at Destination Linux. That's the same thing. What? Shut up, Michael. <laughs> you can become a patron is my point. <laughs> and if you're a patron, yeah. guess what? If you're a patron, you're automatically not a pensioner. And you're automatically, automatically not wearing Crocs. You're not wearing and Crocs. Yeah. Pen chewer. It, 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 it kind of sounds like a run-on uh, <laughs> word when Ryan says it. <laughs> I mean, I heard pen chewer. Now I have to go back and listen to see what he said. Jill making pen fun chewer. of me, Michael? I think Jill is pen making fun of me. chewer. Jill's making fun of me. <laughs> Remember when Jill was nice, Michael, and she didn't make I know, it was like 20 minutes ago. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God.
I'm just kidding. You can watch oh. the show live, okay? Jeez. You can watch the show live and watch the live show if you want to by yeah. becoming a patron by going to DougSigital.com slash membership. And also, that's just one of the cool perks that you get when you become a patron. You also get, like we said, you get a cr- credit automatically and not do not have to repent for your Crocs or pen chewing <laughs> and other things, as well as the unedited version of the show if you can't make it to the live. So you can still get access to it. And those unedited versions are ad-free. Plus, you can get all sorts of other stuff, including access to our patron-only post show that happens every week after the <laughs> live show or the show that you watch live. You can go to tuxdigital.com slash membership to sign up to get all of these perks. Plus, we have <laughs> some we have some merch that you can go to tuxdigital.com slash store to get that, like the mug that Jill has right now, the <laughs> DOS Geek mug. Also, the Destination Linux t-shirts, uh, the This Weekend Linux shirts, the DOS Geek hat, uh, there's hoodies, there's mugs, there's stickers, there's so much and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. After you all buy that great merch, make sure to check out all the amazing shows here on Tux Digital so you can wear the merch for your favorite show. <laughs> I like that. And, you dress up for your show. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We have an entire network of shows to fill your entire week with geeky goodness. Check out the DOS Geek channel. Yes, I mean, yes, you can yes. If you want to. <laughs> Ryan reviews it's right. awesome tech, discusses way to, <laughs> ways to keep your privacy intact online, and geeks out on all things open source and Linux. And recently, he just did a um, holiday gift guide for, for That's geek right. yeah, in your the life. Geek buying guide for yeah. Christmas. And yeah. I referenced <laughs> that in the latest episode of Twill, which, which came out. Yeah. Technically speaking, when this comes out, it would already be out. So you could check it out That's in the sweet, show Michael. notes. Really but I sweet. covered it. Yeah, because I also <laughs> I wanted people to know that this happened, that you made this very valuable thing. But I also yeah. wanted to cover this insanely stupid product that I want. And that is a ugly sweater from Microsoft with the Windows XP wallpaper. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I get that, I, man. It's it's very stupid. Yeah. And no, I, I don't it. want it on principle, but also I kind of do. You know, it looked good with your Crocs while you're peeing in a pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure everyone to head to textdigital.com and subscribe to all our incredible shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching and the full Monte of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have an awesome week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Unless you're on that journey in Crocs, in which your journey's not important, clearly, to you. <laughs> the journey is still Crocs. important. You're just going to be slower in those Crocs. That's <laughs> yeah. It. It's still important. Did unless you you're, unless your destination is to pee in a pool like Ryan. Then <laughs> that's not a good journey. <laughs> Look, I only defend people or pool or peace. Why am I reversing everything? What am I, Yoda today? Jeez. You're oh, God. Here. <laughs> freaking what Yoda, man. About? I don't what know what's are we even talking Crazy. about? Yeah, this is, I don't know. Oh my goodness. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Love you all. Me. We'll see you next week. <laughs>